Ahoy there, landlubbers! Whispers in the Sea is an actual play series drawing elements from stories of fantasy horror, political drama, and swashbuckling action and adventure pirate stories. As such, a list of content warnings will always be made available in the description. You see this eyeless, smooth monstrosity slithering its way up towards you. Its teeth are black as obsidian. Its multiple rows of teeth sharp as daggers. Its gaping maw opening, trying to suck in water and you along with it, but you are able to tether yourself and pull yourself through, back through the hull of the ship, into the lower deck, right as the sea snake gets like a huge bite into the bottom of the ship. I might be able to help. I'm I'm gonna go up front. What? Okay, whatever. And then, <laughs> uh, and uh, Hano's like, you follow him, I guess? He's got something? I don't know. In my distress, I called on the goddess and she answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and she heard my cry. I think you hear the whining and almost kind of feel as this enormous creature sinks into the ocean, away from the ship. I would like to give you one last chance to leave here alive. Oh, are you losing your spine already? I thought you pirates were better than that? Uh, some pirates may be, but my friend, I can be so much worse than you can possibly imagine. Felix is going to transform back into the bird, and as he does so, a swarm of other birds made of fire and smoke spring from where he flies away from. You're leading quite the trail, aren't you? Oh, don't write me off so quickly. And he directs the flaming birds to enter the gun ports of the ship, and, um... Ignite as much of uh, the potentially very flammable material that is in there. And there's this moment of silence before a fiery ball of light explodes from the ship. Does that count as protecting the ship? Yes, Felix. Glad I could help. Bren is dazed, sitting on the floor of the lowermost deck, holes in the vessel, water coming in, patches and puddles of that same dark shimmering ichor mixing with the water, the water almost looking like the night sky. sailors and welcome to another episode of tales yet told an actual play podcast dedicated to telling weird and fun stories full of imagination thoughtful characterization and inclusivity i am your most humble of game masters captains and uh, well uh, whatever else you want to call me kendrick or kendo if you prefer i use they he pronouns and with me today are the saltiest sea dogs a captain could ask for gus well howdy y'all i'm Wait, have I done this You've joke done already? It. Yes, you have. You did this God with the damn. first okay. episode. It's a fucking banjo. Oh, no. Bro. Oh, oh yeah. no. You're right. Okay. Um, yeah, hi. I'm Gus. I <laughs> use he and pronouns. I'm going to be playing uh, Felix, 
Cormier, a terrible, terrible man who does cool magic things. And it's going to be a good time. It is going to be a good time. You know who else is a good time? <laughs> oh, no, we're doing this again. I can't lead it to, I, I refuse to disrespect anyone uh, by, he by, by, by me, and that would have been fine. You know who else is a good time? Ellis. I, I'm a good time. <laughs> I can be anything you want me to be. Actually, historically speaking, I have been several different people for several, several different human beings. Uh, and on this particular podcast, I am Thorin, and also Eldorus, and also sometimes Ellis, in the kind of in-betweens. Um, hello. What, uh, what pod, uh, what podcast? <laughs> what, pronoun- <laughs> what pronouns do all of those people you just mentioned be using? Well, uh, I myself do use they, them pronouns, uh, and then Thorin uses he, him pronouns, and then Eldorus takes over the she, her pronouns. So yeah, uh. Gotta cover all your bases. I cover all my bases, and you can uh, DM me for whatever person you'd like me to be, and that's fine. <laughs> all right. Oh. Who, you know who else you can DM to ask them to be whatever person you want them to be? Hilda. <laughs> that's me. Whatever you want to be. <laughs> this is the most rancid start we've had to this show. Uh, I'm Hilda. I use she, her pronouns. I play Avery Morrigan, who uses he, him pronouns, and is a very good little lad. I guess I'll leave it there so you can use that segue. You know who else is just a good little lad? (laughs) Marcy. Hi, I'm Marceline. Oh, the ASMR. I'm a good little lad. (laughs) Oh, no. My pronouns are she, her. I play Bryn Thera. And she also uses she, her pronouns. What? Am I in the wrong show? No, no, you're... I don't know anymore. Uh, I don't even know what show you're on. uh, I'm sorry. I thought we were on Whispers in the Sea. I'm sorry. Oh, fuck, you're right. You're so right. You know what? You know what? That was good. You're, and good. you know what? You are so right, because this is another game of Whispers in the Sea, where we are playing Rapscallion, or the Ashcan edition of Rapscallion by Whistler. And uh, it's our it's a pirate game. Uh, if this is your first time listening to us, thank you so much for listening. But also, this is a very weird place to start. This is in the middle of something. There's a whole ge- you just You ever just walk? You ever where just- is it? Yes. If you listen in the right order, though. That's true. That's true. This is episode. Hey, guys. This is Zach, editor for the show. Just dropping in to let the crew know that this is episode eight. Yeah, episode eight. Okay, back to the show. Thank you so much, Zach. All right, we have to move on. We We have have to to move on. Okay. (sighs) Um, But yes, uh, we're getting back into our wonderful, dramatic, pirate, queer game uh, where we are... A bunch of sad pirates on this ship, uh, just trying to make by. Uh, but yeah, let's let's just start playing. Our camera fades in on a burning ship, wood splintering beneath the molten heat of the gunpowder explosion that has ripped apart the sliver of justice. Our camera pans over dozens of naval soldiers swimming their way away from the ship, trying to grab onto pieces of driftwood to remain afloat above this dark ocean that they find themselves adrift on. Not everyone has survived. In the distance, we see the Bois Perdu with its starlit sails sailing away in the distance, the hull barely sewn together as bits and pieces of it seem to fall off of the ship and dissipating into stardust as the pieces hit the water. Its movement is slow, 
and burdensome as it makes its way through the water. Our camera moves up and past this burning ship towards the Bois Perdue, where on the main deck of the ship, some members of the crew of the Bois Perdue have encircled Felix Cormier, uh, praising him for his outstanding work at dealing with the Navy. They cheer and, 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 and pour drinks and sing in your honor. And there are all these questions uh, surrounding you, asking you, how did you do that? How long could you have done that? Could you teach me how to do that? That was fucking sick. What is it like? All of these, all of these array of questions that are kind of at you, but not necessarily really directed at you, more uh, spoken thoughts in this flurry of uh, emotion and celebration with you at the center of it, Felix. How are you feeling in this moment? Honestly, Felix is on cloud nine. Felix has done the two things, uh, or he, he is relishing the two things he loves most, and those are um, causing chaos and getting attention. And right now, he has he has both of that, and he is he's just eating it up. As our camera kind of. Uh, floats above you as you're eating up all of this uh, this attention, this uh, ferocious, uh, excited energy. Our camera moves on to Thorin. Thorin, you are sitting here along the decks. You found you found like a little spot for yourself to sit, kind of away from where everybody's kind of like walking around, like cheering amongst each other. Um, still stunned from working with the cannons, the screaming, dripping cannons of the Bois Perdue, whose eldritch sounds have still deafened you, your ears ringing from the concussive blows. What is going on through your mind? Thorin doesn't allow for anything to go through his mind other than standing up and uh, he immediately starts doing a sweep of the crew, making sure everyone is accounted for going front to back. We've just been in a, you know, we've just had a standoff with somebody, quite literally shots fired, sea bat, you know. Um, yeah. So I think Thorin goes by deck, by deck, and, you know, I would think probably, if I can say as much, until he stumbles on Bryn. I think that Avery would have made it to her first because yeah, Avery was sure. heading there. I don't know if he would immediately go in because I think more than anything, Thorin is, everybody seems to be safe. But what the fuck just happened? And so Thorin is intentionally kind of peering around the area of where Bryn is. Thorin, uh, as you are walking from deck to deck, checking on things, um, checking on people, you know, everyone's more or less accounted for. Some people a bit, uh, you know, uh, bruised up, knocked around uh, because of, you know, everything that the ship had gone through. And you all did take a few hits from uh, the Navy ship. Um and so, you know, there's a, a few people kind of battered around, some of them making their way down to the doctor's office. Uh, a lot of them, you know, kind of have, have found themselves uh, just also uh, wandering around. You know, there there's still things to do here, right, as far as their job is. The, while many are celebrating, there's still uh, many who are trying to make sure that things are taken care of. And uh, as you're kind of going around this ringing in your ears, you know, people passing you by uh, and your mind uh, aflutter with all of these possibilities of like, what the fuck did just happen, right? Our camera, I think, passes by uh, Avery, who is making his way down, straight down, knowing exactly what his goal is, looking for Bryn um, as the two of you pass each other. Uh, in the halls amongst uh, uh, one of the decks of the ship, 
uh, Avery, you are heading down to where Bryn is. Um, there's been a lot. A mm-hmm. lot has gone on. You have steered the ship. You have uh, used your book's magics on the uh, on the sea bat uh, that had gotten a very uh, a tight hold uh, on your ship. And you have uh, done something incredible in the wake of what seemed to be a lot of incredible things that has happened on this ship tonight. And you're going to go check on Bryn because, well, you haven't seen her and... Of the many incredible things on this ship, surely some of it had to have some root there. What What is going on uh, in your mind as you head down looking for Bryn? Um, I think the whole idea is that, uh, you know, I obviously went and I, I did what I could. I've been doing a bunch of different things, like you said, being up steering the ship. And I felt that connection with Bryn when I was doing that. And then trying to save the ship from the sea bat. And um, having done the steering and having put together a couple of the pieces with how Bryn is connected with the ship, at least. um, Knowing that the ship has taken any damage, I also want to know if Bryn is okay. Because um, she wasn't upstairs when, like, everyone else was. So just wanting to check all the... All, um, all the boxes, basically the same as Thorin, but also knowing that there might be something more involved with it. And there's probably uh, there's probably some underlying just like pure curiosity mm-hmm. that's going into that as well. Absolutely. Uh, both you and Thorin, as the two of you are, are walking around, checking on things, I think it becomes quite obvious, especially to you, Thorin, that the ship seems to be barely holding itself together right now. It is, despite the... I mean, the the ship did take some physical damage, right? You all were hit by some of uh, the cannon fire from the Sliver of Justice. You all did get bitten into by um, the sea bat. But even so, you are noticing damage that could not have been caused by either of those things. Internal damage here. Uh, in ways that feel less like something has hit the ship and more like the ship itself is just kind of falling apart, where floorboards feel less sturdy, where portholes are cracked and splintered and pieces of it falling off, uh, where uh, lights and lanterns that were, like, uh, held up or, like... uh, uh, kind of placed around the ship, glass cracked uh, on uh, the panes of it. And even what feels just like in places debris of like some kind of dust or like wood splintering from floors and ceilings above you. Um, nothing right now about this ship feels stable in a way that is very, very troubling, especially probably to you, Bosun, who should be keeping the, whose, like, job it is to make sure that the ship is okay. Um, But yeah, Avery, you're the first to find Brent as you make your way all the way down to the bottommost deck. You spot amongst all of these supply boxes and uh, crates and, and other, like, bags and stuff. You spot Bryn, on the floor, curled up in like a fetal position in a pool of starlight liquid. Okay. Bryn, describe what Avery sees upon finding you. I think as Avery approaches, (laughs) um, Avery sees Bryn in this fetal position, just like her head fixed upon that pool um, that surrounds her and her head just cocked to the side in almost a detached stare and her side is leaking this star fluid. Um, And as uh, Avery approaches, I think through the ship, Avery hears Bryn talking 
and Avery would overhear Bryn speaking into the pool, saying, Oh, it was a beautiful creature, wasn't it? Oh, no, I promise. Your soul will be free like mine in time. I think that's, like, as Avery approaches, that's, like, what Avery is hearing. Coming upon this scene, I think... It's just a very otherworldly kind of atmosphere and also one that's that feels very fragile to Avery. So I would approach very cautiously listening, taking in all the details because I obviously want to understand as much of it as I can. And as I get a little bit closer, um, I would just call out to Bren very softly Bryn? Bryn, can you hear me? I think as you call out, Bryn still has this sort of, like, distinct gaze into the pool and, like, her body sort of swaying back and forth. And as you call out, Bryn is still talking to the pool and you hear, I think there's no place to be. I think it's something of a prison. Um... Avery, how are you, Avery? Bryn, you're, you're injured. Are, are you all right? Oh, it'll take more than a few battings around for me. Is this, is everyone all right on the ship? Um. No, no, I don't. I don't think it's coming back. Bryn, I, I think you should. I, I think you should uh, come to the the doctors. Come. Can you stand up? And I'm like going to offer, I'm going to like kind of crouch down to get by Bryn. And I'm just going to like hold out a hand. Yeah, I'm just offering support. I'm trying to, I can tell that Bryn seems disjointed. And I want to try and ground her again a little bit. Bryn, can you hear my voice? Can you tell me what's what's happening? Are you in pain? Oh, no, I promise he means well. He's so kind. Oh, Avery, they are glad to meet you. I think I'm all right. I could use a hand, yes. And Bryn kind of like locks eyes with you. Uh, all right. Um, I'm pleased to meet them too. Do you hear them, Avery? I, I don't. I'm sorry, Bryn. Oh, but I hope you will soon enough. I really think we need to get you to the doctors now. And I'm going to try and, like, pick Bryn up a little bit with, like, support her. As you do, like, Bryn kind of comes to her feet. And I think, like, you know, kind of you like, puts an arm around you. I like, kind of support her as, like, you move. And as you ever, like, you start moving, just Bryn's kind of mumbling to distant voices as you walk with her. Thorne, you find yourself somewhere uh, along the stairs leading down into this room, having caught perhaps a little bit of this conversation. And yeah, you find yourself here as Avery is helping up uh, Bryn. I think Thorne just kind of slowly comes up to you guys, but knowing the state that Bryn is in uh, without, tries to kind of take hold of Bryn away from you, Avery to kind of mm -hmm. shift it so that he can just 100% completely pick her up. And he's, come here, love. And do you, without protest, get scooped? I think that as Thorin scoops Bryn, like, looks to Thorin, and, like, kind of just looks Thorin in the eyes and is like, Oh, hi, Thorin. You've won for us, have you? I'm so sorry. Thorn, you can't hear shit. Yep. Your ears still I ringing. I can't hear anything. Nope. The ri uh, the ringing, uh, the, sorry, the deafened weakness says you can't hear anything until mm -hmm. you get medical care or extended rest. Uh. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, that is the weakness you currently have. So regardless of how you feel about it, Thorn's going to come in, pick you up, and is taking you quickly to the uh to the doctor 
uh, I'll say Bryn has stopped and like has like spoken to you, um, and you don't hear her. What is your response? Uh, yeah, I think after a while, Thorn would would look down to kind of see how you're doing and maybe see your lips moving, and he would look at you and he would nod, and uh, say, "All right then, we just gotta get you to the doctor right quickly. All right, love." Don't worry. As Thorin looks down at Bryn, Bryn stares into Thorin's eyes, and I use size up. Okay. I As can't you... hear anything, but <laughs> we've got like a place to be. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, as uh, the two of you are holding hands, and Bryn tries to delve deeper into holding hands, I am bride carrying Bryn to the doctor. What a tease! What a t- <laughs> Okay, cool. So while you're bride carrying uh, uh, Bren, uh, Bren, you are attempting to size up. When you size up, roll plus vinegar. That's a plus one, baby. That is a eight. Awesome. Interesting, interesting, interesting. This is very fun. So once you're below four health, which is sometimes referred to being in the dark, dark area of your health bar, you're compelled to be done for. On a seven to nine four size up, you get to ask one question and they get to, uh, or you get one hold, which you can spend to ask one question. They also get one hold. I'm sorry, you get two hold on a hit. So you get, uh, so you get two hold. You can ask two questions. Thorn, you get one hold. You can ask one question from the size up list. I think that. You know, as you kind of lock eyes with Bryn, for a moment they flash uh, a bit brighter than they have been. And you haven't heard anything, but what you hear rapping through your skull are the words, Thorin, are you okay? Thorin hears this inside his mind. Um, I, what I'll say is it sounds like Bryn's voice is the clearest thing wrapping through your mind. Um, outside of that, there are whispers of other several voices in the background of her own. I, I imagine it's, you know, I think it's Eowyn from Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah, when she does, like, the weird elf uh, yeah. connection thing. Yeah. That's Galadriel. Yeah, or is it Galadriel? Yeah, yeah Galadriel. Yeah. yeah, correct, 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 correct. That's what I imagine it kind of sounds like, like that sort of like whisk, like there's like that whisper yeah. and that that like that like sound, almost like the, like the windiness of it all. How am I? Ah, uh, I'm unnerved. Where are you? I'm right here, Thorin, in your arms. Oh, love, you're in my head. Well, who doesn't hear voices now and then? I hear voices often, frankly. I'm glad to join. The beautiful chorus. How can I get you to tell me what you are? What your goals are? I think that it's similar to the same vision that Avery had. But this one flickers more violently and is much less vivid. And it flickers between that vision that Avery had being stand atop that mountainside as Bryn is hovering in the air celestial form, a fireball coming down, but that flickers between that and a vision of these ghostly starlit vessels surrounding a large gate that glows in blackness and all of these vessels heading towards it, all of the crews yelling and panicking, and it flickers back to that mountainside, and then it flickers back to a quiet forest full of trees their bark looking eerily similar to the wood of the ship and a clear night sky and flickering once more back to that mountain top the fireball coming closer and closer and closer and the vision ends i think by this point we've reached the doctor so he brings you in and is holding you, gently puts you down on the table, looks to the doctor, says, good luck with this one, and looks at you one more time, doesn't say a word, and leaves quickly. As you look at Bren, she looks forlorn, and a sort of sad smile 
across her face. He accepts that and walks away. Avery, you are standing here uh, as Thorin has just walked away after putting down uh, Bryn on the table, uh, the quote-unquote operating table here at Dr. Aleph's uh, office. Uh, you see uh, Dr. Blau, he, he's here uh, and is like kind of calling after Thorin as Thorin is just like walking away, uh, just like, Thorin, Thorin, oh, oh, there he goes, that boy. And we'll kind of turn to Bryn and kind of just look at you for a second and then over to Avery and then back to Bryn and goes, Mr. O, I do not operate on ghosts. I don't know how... Hmm. And it seems like you're still, like, leaking this star fluid from your side onto uh, the table, dripping uh, from there onto the floor. Um, yeah, like, Dr. Blau just kind of s- sits there on his, like, little rolly stool, uh, perplexed as to, like, what <laughs> what does he do, right? As Bryn is sitting there, I want to say that the, the star fluid does emit a, a, a small light Kind of like the night sky. But as Bryn is laying there, um, looking at the ceiling, um, she mutters, uh, Oh, he'll bring it back, I know for sure. I think he'll bring it back. And then turns to the doctor and is like, I don't know what you can do, um, but I appreciate the effort. Um, the stones. I think those will help. What, what stones, Bryn? Oh... The ones from above, Avery. You know, the kind that glow and hum. Like the arrow? I think as you say that, like, Brynn kind of looks, like, a bit, like, away from you and is like, oh, you don't need to know about that. And looks back to Avery. I suppose, yeah, probably. Something of the like. I'm getting a little tired. What do I not need to know about the... I, I would like to help. I You are obviously in pain or hurting. I, I, I don't understand, and I, 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 need, I need to help in some way. Can I say that, like, I'm pulling out, like, my notebook or something, and I'm just, like, looking for anything that I know about Wayfinders that's in my notes? I, I take out my notes, and I'm, I'm looking through my notes. I obviously don't have anything that will specifically help with but but I'm I'm trying so hard to find anything I'm, I want to be helpful basically and I'm panicking a little bit at the fact that I can't do anything to help I think that as you're doing that Bryn looks at you and goes mm, trust your intuition Avery it's a very strong skill of yours bravo on the victory oh mm-hmm, by the way do you hear a little voice in your head when you read? And Bryn falls asleep. Bryn? Bryn? Oh, uh, Bryn? okay. Oh, okay. Um, maybe it is best to uh, let her rest. Uh, she's, mm. I mean, she's obviously not alive, but is she going to... Bleed out? Unlive? I, I don't I... know what the... Mm. Is, she, is she going to be okay? She does seem to be losing lots of fluid. Uh, but I also don't know if she needs the fluid. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, mm, I don't know anything about ghosts. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what... Uh, look, uh, uh, young Avery, please let me uh, handle this. Uh, um, and you see him kind of... Uh, fold his arms across each other as he's, like, tapping his foot, looking down at the sleeping uh, Bren, and goes, maybe, and goes over to his desk, opens up a drawer, pulls out a small book, and flips it open. Uh, there might be something in here. Uh, yeah, young gave relief. I... It is my duty to make sure that everyone on the ship... He's taken care of. I will take care of this as well. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to check on 
her later. Ah, yes, please. Of course. As you leave, uh, he sits down in his uh, little stool next to uh, her, opens up this book and starts reading through it uh, as you head off. Thorin, where were you headed uh, after you left uh, from the doctor's office? Hano. Oh, to Hano? Okay, perfect, actually. So you are, um, so Thorin, you are heading up to the main deck uh, where you last saw Captain Hano and Fontaneva uh, still uh, at the time uh, awkwardly staring off at the uh, flaming ship uh, that you all are sailing away from. Um, Avery, where are you heading after leaving the uh, doctor's office? I was going to go find Thorin because the only lead I had was possibly the arrow. Okay, cool. Our camera moves from Avery as, uh, Avery, you begin uh, following in the direction of uh, Thorin, uh, him being the kind of last clue that you have on uh, where one of these uh, meteorite trunks uh, could be uh, that Bryn may have been referring to, uh, that being the uh, meteorite arrow that she had given him. And uh, Thorin, you were heading up to uh, the main deck in order to find uh, Captain Hano uh, to be able to speak to her. So as the two of you uh, make your way down the hallways up uh, to uh, the main deck, Avery, you uh, following a decent ways behind, probably calling out to Thorin, uh, and Thorin just not hearing <laughs> probably, you. Yeah. <laughs> And you, like, running to try to catch up to him. Uh, and eventually you all make uh, your way up to the top deck where uh, the crew has uh, still kind of, like, in a, a semi-celebratory mood uh, with Felix uh, there amongst them still, per perhaps. Uh, you have had uh, many a cheers and drinks in your name. Um, but that, like, kind of, like, initial, like, celebratory... Um, Feeling is kind of dying down as people are getting back into it. Uh, Captain Hano and Fontaneva, uh, you see, are up uh, by the helm looking down on uh, the main deck as people are starting to get um, back to work. Captain Hano kind of slumped over the railing, um, just kind of looking down, arms crossed, like truly like leaning over almost and like a like a plank uh, kind of scenario and Fontaneva standing next to her back to back to the railing looking like uh, kind of ahead and every now and then like kind of down to Captain Hano as the two of them uh, converse amongst themselves. Uh, that is what you see, uh, Thorin, as you are coming up and then same to you, Avery, as you come up. Uh, Felix, you've been here the whole time. Uh, like, Sam Reich in Game Changer. Um, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Game Changer. I'm sorry. Me too. Uh, good. <laughs> I've been it's here really the good. whole time. Whole time. Uh, but yeah, you all are up here on deck. Uh, what's what's going on? I'll ask you uh, first, Felix, since you've been up here the longest. So Felix is... How much time has passed uh, since... Not that much. Probably like... Uh, 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes tops. Okay. I think Felix is not quite there, but well on his way to uh, being quite drunk. I think now that the sort of celebration is kind of dying down and everyone is, is getting back to, you know, getting back to their, uh, their positions, I think Felix is... I mean, is becoming gradually more alone. Mm -hmm. And I think even even before, like, he is completely alone, he is staring out to see. Yeah, he is staring at uh, where the other ship was. Yeah, I think he looks sort of his his jubilation has has kind of died away. And I think he is sort of just contemplating it. That's where he's at. Amazing. So, yeah, you're just kind of not entirely by yourself, but getting to the point where, like, a few people still come over, give you a nice little slap on the the, the shoulder, kind of cheers you, but move on. And you're kind of given your space here. Um, 
And it's like while you're over here that you see Thorin come up from below deck, um, kind of looking around uh, for for someone. Followed by Avery, who is who is trying to get there. Like Thorin, yeah. Thorin, Thorin. <laughs> Sorry, Thorin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're seeing, yeah. You see a freak very quickly behind them trying to uh, get uh, his um, his attention. And as as uh, you notice them, that you hear Damien's voice again seeping in like smoke through a crack. Don't forget your promise. I know, I know. I can't wait just a little longer. Whenever the time presents itself. I haven't forgotten. No, no, that's not, that's not it. All right. Just making sure. And it dissipates. Thorin, you see uh, Captain Hanno up by the helm um, with uh, Fontaneva. Hanno. Avery has since stopped trying to get your attention because you obviously are ignoring him. But you're, I'm still following the two of you uh, see as uh, she kind of perks her head up and turn uh, in, uh, in in your direction. And uh, Avery, you hear her say, Oh, Thorn, there you are. Uh, is everything all right? No. Wait, shit. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Again, Avery hears it. Thorin, you hear, you see her move her lips, but all you hear is ringing. Before you continue to say anything, I can't hear you, but I have something important to tell you. Bryn is possibly mortally wounded, perhaps twice over mortally wounded in her particular case. I left her with the doctor, but he doesn't know what to do. You know her best. If there's anything that can help her, you need to tell the doctor or do it, whatever that thing is. Upon hearing you say... That you can't hear, <laughs> Avery. Like you, mm-hmm. like if if the camera goes to like you see like a wave of like relief kind of come over Avery. Like, oh, oh, he wasn't ignoring me. The dad okay. wasn't ignoring um, me. Oh, thank God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I wasn't being <laughs> snubbed. Okay, um, and I'm gonna go like I'm gonna angle myself in front of Thor and then, and like tap him on the shoulder, <laughs> <laughs> apologetically. And um, mouth exaggeratedly, the arrow. I'll I'll like make the sign like I'll I'll like make like bow and arrow kind of like movement. I'll say the arrow, and I'll point at Thorn again, and then like a questioning look. Thorn looks at you, and just says, "If you need something from me, if it's on my person, if it's in my cabinet, just take it. Whatever it is." It's yours. <laughs> Do you want what do I let's see what do I have on me? I've uh, got some, I've got some, you know, some cable for outdoors. I've got what's that? That's my <laughs> handkerchief. I'm like, I'm like got, no, 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 I've no, got no, no, no. Like I, I'm waving my I've hands in the, front of you. Uh, the the arrow. Oh yes, and then I mean, the moment you say the arrow, I'll point at it excitedly. Oh, oh yeah, love. Take it. <laughs> I'll take the arrow from you. And I'll, like, mind my thanks. Thorn gives you a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, and then I'll put that into my bag. Okay. And I'll and I'll back off of, like, the... And I'll, I'll, like, apologetically, like, wave my hands again. Be like, I'm sorry to intrude. I'll be on my Captain way. Captain Hanno's gone. She's not here. Oh, Hanno's gone? Is Fontaneva still there? And Felix? Or F- I mean, Felix isn't up here. Felix is down on the main deck. Um... Captain Hanno left as soon as Thorin said Bryn has been mortally wounded. She ran gotcha. she to ran. Okay. the doctor's office. And uh, Fontaneva, it, Fontaneva is still here standing, leaning against the railing, uh, arms crossed, looking off the back of the ship uh, in the direction of uh, the burning naval ship getting smaller in the distance. Yeah, I'll I'll take the arrow and I'll put it into my bag and mind my thanks to Thorin and then I'll I'll actually I guess head back um to my room. Okay. Sounds good. Can I like sort of intercept Avery? 
Uh, yeah, are you doing it before they go down the stairs or after that? Um, after that, I think. Yeah, you can easily uh, run to catch up to him. And um, uh, point of order, now Felix is drunk. Um. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 good. of course, of course, of course. Wonderful. Um, yeah, Felix, uh, you uh, run down uh, uh, after Avery, uh, essentially like kind of catching him uh, at the bottom of the stairs. I think Felix sort of stumbles a little bit and like catches himself on uh, Avery's shoulder, just like a little too, a little too hard, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, he just goes, Avery, Avery, you ever see anything like that shit before? I think the moment you, yeah, you lean on Avery's shoulder and just loudly raucously sort of and I just get hit with like that cloud of like alcohol like straight to the nostrils that burning sensation um and Avery's definitely been around people who are uh too drunk for their own good but um turns to you and is of course uh all politeness uh Felix I've no Never, never seen anything like it before. That was, uh, I mean, I didn't see most of it, honestly. I was below decks, but, uh. Oh, what a shame. It was amazing. I never, I'm sure. No, I assume no. it was your handiwork again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, all the fire and explosions and, oh, uh, this it's, it's incredible. And you, you seem quite quite prolific at things going up in flame. Sure. I'm getting the weird energy coming off of Felix and trying to like extricate myself a little bit from this conversation. I- I'm trying to do the thing where you don't tip off your drunk friend that you're trying to like leave or put them to bed or like, yeah, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Where I'm like, of course, great work. Good job. Um, yes. But of course hey, uh, you're doing great work. Yes. Are you, you have, you have, you have the air, don't you? Felix, you can size up Avery if you would like. Or Avery, you can size up Felix. Felix is drunk. I'm not. Uh, yeah, can yeah, I yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Roll plus vinegar. Seven. On a seven to nine, you get a hit. You hold two. Felix also gets a hold. Of one. So two questions for Avery, one question for Felix. You can ask, what sorts of treasure are you carrying? How are you actually feeling? What's your goal here? What aces do you have up your sleeve? Or how could I get you to blank? Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll look at um, Felix after asking me that question. And I'll respond, why do you need it? And that's what's your goal here. This could be um be interesting. I feel like since this is since this is like a move, Felix just goes, he he wants he wants me to get it. I don't know why. He just he wants me to get it. He? Don't worry. Don't you, you don't know him. You don't know him. I certainly don't. Felix, are you are you feeling alright? How are you really feeling? Hmm. Least cryptic pirate crew, by the way. Least <laughs> cryptic pirate crew. I think Felix like l- laughs, but it's kind of like a like a forced kind of laugh, and then he goes, "I'm doing incredible! I burst a ship into flames. I sent shrapnel and bodies burning through the sky. What a spectacle! What a beautiful thing! And surely." Surely, it can only get more beautiful, right? Right? Surely, this is this isn't all it is, right? And surely, something about this is going to matter. Something about this is going to make sense to to me or something. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. But it's 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 so. I just need the arrow. That's that's what it is, right? If if you believe so, but I really 
think anything will make more sense if you sleep on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I like carefully put a like a hand on uh Felix's back, like a little a little pat. Sleep would do you well, I believe, and uh maybe things will make some more sense in the morning. Where's Bryn? Bryn is Bryn is sleeping. Bryn is resting. And you should be too. I like lean I like lean into Felix. I'm, you you should be too. You should rest, Felix. You get one question. Unless you're too drunk. <laughs> no, I uh, so I I think what Felix wants to know is how is Avery actually feeling? Um Avery is uh I think you can even through the drunken haze, you can tell that Avery's just uh, a little on guard, a little wary. I, I would hope the idea is that um, he is on guard and wary more because of your state of mind right now. You are being drunk. Um, but there is an underlying wariness of you as well because Avery has not had a ton of interactions with Felix and they have been disjointed interactions at best. And um, he is very unsure of your motivations regarding yeah, the arrow and things in general, especially after your, your drunken rant about um, the meaninglessness of it right now. On guard, but not, uh, not, not hostile, not just wary. I think Felix leaves. I think he just walks away. We're two. I don't think he goes to bed. I think he's, uh, I think he just like goes back to kind of where he was before staring out at the sea. Avery, you head to your room, you said? Yeah. Okay. Thorin, what about you? Thorin is greeted by Eldorus, who is in a bit of a, a panic. She says, Thorin, I couldn't find you. I couldn't find you. And Thorin, not being able to hear, just sees her feathers ruffled and in a panic, you know, can at least see that. And he says, I'm sorry, Eldur, I can't hear you. I'm, it's okay. It's okay, love. It's a different ship. It's a different time. We're okay. And uh, picks her up and just kind of nuzzles into her and, and cradles her back to the cabinet so he can rest, put maybe cotton in his ears and just try to regain his hearing because it he's lost his hearing, you know, before at different times. It's something he's struggled with, but this is the longest time it's gone on. And uh, I think he's scared of that. Do you sit down and rest here in your closet uh, trying to take the night to heal. Um, I think our camera moves out of this room into and through the doctor's office where we get brief glimpses of uh, Dr. Blau and Captain Hano uh, as Hano is standing above the operating table that Bryn is lying on resting in a pool of starlight liquid, no longer flowing from her side, uh, but still there, coalesced beneath her. And out of this room, uh, past uh, Felix, who is uh, making his way back up to uh, the, the main deck that people are slowly filing uh, out of, and to Avery as he enters his room, closing the door behind him uh, with uh, this arrow and all your books and notes in tow. What do you do? Uh, Avery sits down on his cot, um, takes his little satchel off and um, opens it up, takes out the arrow, takes out his notebook and starts like flips to a, a blank page and starts sketching out what the arrow looks like, writing down the details of it, how it appears, how it feels, and goes like into full study mode and like lights a candle 
and is, um, you know, looking through all of his different books at everything about Wayfinders, everything about uh, meteors, <laughs> and um, just like is getting everything down in his notes that he can. And after he's documented everything um, about the arrow, puts it back in his bag along with the notebook and then puts it under his pillow. While you are, are, are kind of looking through your notes and writing these notes down, uh, you have a potential here to use your Sea Scholar ability when you encounter strange, dangerous knowledge related to your pursuits. Uh, roll plus Spitfire, if you would like to. Absolutely. Okay. Eight. On a hit, you can ask one question about it, and the fates will answer honestly, but you're also compelled to learn more at any cost. Not necessarily in this moment, but as we continue along. So ask me any question about this arrow. What about this arrow? What properties of this arrow make it useful and valuable? Why does Felix want it? Why is it helpful for um, Bryn? As you are studying this uh, this arrow, like going through all of your notes, uh, notes about wayfinders, notes about uh, Driftwood Cathedral, uh, even your notes uh, from what uh, Bryn had told you before uh, a little bit about, you know, who she is or uh, kind of the home of things. I think as you are like going through your notes and you're examining this arrow, you feel it a little bit. You feel the faint vibration in it. it it's, it's hard to describe because it's not quite a physical feeling as much as it is just kind of like a sense that you have, you know, almost that like, you know, the concept that like animals can somehow perceive earthquakes and other like uh, tremors and things of that nature, like before they happen. It's that kind of sense where it's not quite an actual physical feeling. Like you're not feeling it literally vibrate in your hand. But there is a, a dull throbbing sensation that emanates from specifically the meteorite tip of this arrow that as you kind of, I'm imagining you kind of like try to touch the actual tip to see if like, is this actually vibrating? And I think there's this split moment as you are touching it, um, this meteorite arrow blessed uh, by the celestials through Bryn, you see yourself standing at the helm of the ship. There's a naval ship not too far away, and uh, Fontaneva is calling up to you from the main deck of the ship. She's standing at like this huge wheel at this post uh, and one of the masts uh, helping uh, maneuver the ship. Uh, and like, there's this moment where you're like, oh shit, wait, this is before. This is uh, when, th this is when I was about to turn the ship, um, tr trying to avoid the, the naval fire. And, you know, you remember what you did in that moment and you kind of instinctively do it in this vision, and as the ship begins to turn with the great weight of you, like, s trying to budge this wheel, it's a little too slow, and it's a little too late. And you turn as you hear the cacophony of the booming of cannon fire from the sliver of justice as cannons careen into the Bois Perdue, smashing the mast uh, where Fontaneva and the other crew were taking three of them off of the ship. She is trapped underneath the mast as it falls down and onto the helm where you are, and right before the mast falls on you, you're back here in your room, your fingers just barely touching the head of this meteorite. So it basically showed me another reality. Another potential thing that could have happened. That maybe did happen somewhere. And I think there's a moment where 
do you think about that? And you're like, does it just, and you touch it again, and you see a different version. This time you're able to successfully move, but the ship, and it kind of continues to play out, but the ship gets attacked by the sea bat and is dragged under. And then there's another one where you don't quite move fast enough. The mass is taken out, but Fontenay was able to get out of the way, run up to you, and is able to push you out of the way before the mass falls on you. And you all continue to do the thing, and then the sea bat comes and it drags you under. There's another version, and there's just like, I think maybe for the rest of the night— as you are compelled to learn more, do you stand your ground against the sky? I think like you do it a few times and it happens and like you see yourself die a lot in all of these different versions. I I want to know as I'm seeing all of these, I want to know if there's like, was this the only one that went right? Is this only showing me what went wrong? Is it going to show me another way? It could have like, I, I, Another one, another one. I need to know. And you keep doing it. And I think our camera lingers here, no longer flashing back and forth with you, just watching as you touch the meter right, kind of go into this daze for a couple of seconds, let go, and then touch it again, go into a daze, let go, and that over and over and over and over again. Are all of them failures? Not all of them. In some way, okay. Some of them you live years, and you see your life play out in front of you. You make choices. Some of them you die old, happy, married with children. Some of them you die early on the ship. Some of them somewhere in between. Some of them you're caught by the Navy, and are executed. Some of them, your father ends up finding out about this, has everybody on the ship executed and you are brought back home. There are countless ways this can go. So many different potentials. And you just watch them play out over and over again. And what is truly seconds, but for you sometimes feel like decades. Felix, is there anything you do before you go to bed? I'm I am I'm correct in saying that um Captain Hano is no longer She went down to the doctor's office. So she is not up there. Fontaneva is though. Okay. Probably at this point, like trying to corral the rest of the people, like, all right, you all had your celebration. We need to get the we need to get the fuck moving. All right. Make sure that everything's in order so that the ship is heading the right way, and then everybody go to sleep. Uh sleep this off, rest up. We're gonna have a busy ass day tomorrow. I think Felix is like looking for Captain Hano, but when he sees that she's not there and Fontaneva is, I think he, I think he addresses, addresses her instead. And I think he just says, like, normally he would say this and be like, very, you know, cocky about it. But I think this is like, pretty sincere. He just like stares at Fontaneva and just asks, what did you think? You kind of catch her off guard as she is just, like, sent off uh, <laughs> two of the other crew members uh, down below. Uh, one of them, uh, like, completely heads off. And I think there's uh, this other one who, like, for a moment, like, sees you say that, like, to her. And it's, uh, she's, like, somewhere, like, in her 30s. Uh, you, you've, uh, I mean, you've seen her around uh, on the ship. Uh, her name is uh, Katarina Reichman. Uh, from uh, Ziegenland, uh, apparently uh, they had picked her up like not necessarily like a couple of months before you were picked up. Um, she's like five four somewhere, uh, kind of like a lightish brown hair, real muddy complexion, uh, like sunburned, freckled. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, scars. Uh, she's. Got like this muscular build, you know. Uh, she uh, she's one of the people uh, who works the cannons usually, along with Thorin. Real sharp features, light blue eyes, and there's this moment where like she kind of stops, looks between the two of you, kind of waiting to see like what Fontaneva is going to say in response before Fontaneva kind of motions for her to like run off, and she kind of nods and and does so. And Fontaneva goes, 
Felix, I don't right know what I think of that or anything that has happened today, if I'm being honest. I think you're dangerous. You are a lit candle in a room of gunpowder. I just hope you know who to turn that power against and when. And I hope to the seven it is never against us. I think Felix just sits sits on that for a moment. And then I think he just nods. Not affirming or or denying, but just satisfied with that answer. And he um starts to walk away and stops and says, I hope so too. And then he walks away. Where to? I think he goes to bed. Felix, that night you go to bed probably still pretty drunk and so not quite, you know, fully as sober in the way. Like, do you, describe to me what it's like as, as Felix tries to go to bed here. Yeah. Where would Felix sleep? Like, what, what's the... What's There's the probably, kind of like, a communal, like, bunk room where That's most kind of people yeah. sleep uh, outside of, like, uh, you know, I, Captain Hano has her own room. I think uh, Fontaneva also chooses to sleep amongst, the, like, the communal room. I think Avery has been given his own room uh, as per, you know, kind of a station. Also, it makes things look good if someone comes on a ship and is like, oh, yeah, this the important person has their own room, right, uh, place to keep their stuff. Uh, it also is a way to uh, make sure that no one takes anything uh, from Avery um, and to give him a bit of privacy, especially because not everyone is all on board the Avery chariot here. For sure, um, for sure. And so, yeah, probably like a communal like bunk room. Yeah, I think uh, I think going going to bed uh, tonight is is a bit of an ordeal for Felix. I think there's like a moment where he's like trying to get into bed and then like can't, and then like kind of like trips and like is like lying on the ground for a moment and like for for a little bit is just like maybe I'll just sleep here but then decides that's not a good idea. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it I think it takes him a full like 20 minutes to actually get settled in 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 a sleeping position correctly. Um, but he gets there. Amazing. Yeah. And as he's falling, it like head just like spinning, obviously, mm -hmm. as he's as he's falling asleep. Yeah. As you lay there and time passes, more people kind of come in uh finishing like the uh you know finishing some of their shifts waking some people up to take their shifts and people are going about their nightly routine as the night passes and i think our camera kind of like sitting like just like a, a medium shot of Felix as he is like laying down and like a time lapse of all of the people moving around him uh, and it slowly gets closer and closer and closer. And we see that we're zooming in on the jacket pocket of Felix Cormier. And we see, inching out of it, this wriggling worm moving its way out of your pocket. And we follow it as it crawls up onto your like slopped over hand that's like off of the, like just like a little bit off of the, the, the cot, moves up your arm to your shoulder. And we see as the worm slowly wriggles its way up and over your cheek, finding its way into your ear, it slowly funnels in until it's gone all the way in. Would you love Felix if he was a worm? <laughs> yes. It's just so upsetting as an audiologist. The ear, specifically. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. It does. I like know. pretty often. <laughs> I know it does. Watch out what rivers you're going in, kids. Uh. <laughs> because those leeches, other microscopic things, do not care. If it is a hole, they're going in it. Yay. Friends. <laughs> All right. Felix? That night you dream, one of many dreams that you have had, of a job, of a person, 
you have been tasked with by your guild to kill. What are these dreams like usually? Is it like a, a sequence of scenes? Is it just like an image of the person in like a dark room? Like what what is it what are these dreams like? I think that these dreams start pretty indistinguishable from just like any any other kind of dream. It's just like it's just sort of a scene. Mm -hmm. And it's never really clear like whether this scene is like something that's actually happening or has happened or will happen or whatever, or if it is completely just manufactured, but it is a scene of, uh, you know, the, the, the person, the target in the, um, you know, in the, in the typical location and environment that they would be. And at some point during the dream, a sparrow lands on that person's shoulder. Mm. Are you always a character in this scene? Like you are a person moving about, like looking around at like maybe other people in the scene being like, okay, which one is it? And then you see the sparrow and then you're like, all right, that's the one. I think it's sort of a, uh, I don't think he's present in the scene. I think he's just it. observing it. Yeah. Um, like a, the example that came to mind was like if you were like in a Halo Forge, uh, if you're in Forge mode and sure, you're like flying yeah. around. In yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. 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 It's very much like that. Yeah. Awesome. This dream, this scene, begins on a ship. It is you are in the hallways of a ship, and. Uh, you know, your vision is kind of like, it's empty at first, I think. It's just a dark, you can see like, there's like a porthole nearby, like where you are, and you can see outside it's nighttime. And there is kind of these faceless people moving about, walking in and out of rooms, carrying crates, talk, having conversations, muddled whispers in the background. And you move through these hallways. And I, and I think there's a part of you that, like, as you're moving through them, that you're like, oh, wait, something about this feels familiar. Something about this space feels very familiar. And you're moving through them, and you come, like, you find, like, a set of stairs, and, like, it's almost, like, intuitive how you move through this ship. And, it, and it, like, it feels so natural. Um, but all these, like, faceless people move like even like through you as if you're not there because you're not and it move your vision moves up the stairs to the main deck of the ship and you get a chance to look around at all these faceless people and that's when you recognize you've seen this ship before obviously you've seen this ship before you're on this ship as you find yourself in the main deck of the Bois Perdue a singular person stands out to you leaning against the railing of the ship, looking out into the wide expanse of the ocean, you see Katarina, the only person with a face, standing there, looking off, and she turns as if somehow aware of your presence and, like, looks at you in the way as if she's looking you directly in the eyes. And you see she starts to cough, <laughs> choking. And as she coughs, feathers <laughs> start falling out of her mouth and you see a beak pointing its head out of her mouth, trying to squirm to get free. And she coughs and she falls to her knees, coughing, gagging, desperately trying to pull these feathers out of her mouth until eventually this black sparrow <laughs> and falls against the deck of the ship. Its eyes white as pearls and it caws and looks at you. And then she looks at you, eyes black. And you wake up. It's the next morning.
proud member of the Rainbow Roll Network. Rainbow Roll. Our, our stories, our voices.